Amen. Hallelujah. For the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Amen. That's a good Trinitarian blessing. As you know, today is Father's Day. Amen. This is a day the government sets apart and sets aside to honor the fathers of our nation. Even though we've come a long way from Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver, if you've ever seen those, well, I'm sure you, they're reruns, right? Because we never saw them live. Now it's Ozzy Osbourne and Homer Simpson. Said Simpsons having no relation to the real Simpsons from the real Hollywood. <laughs> Namely, yours truly. Okay. Nevertheless, from a Christian point of view, having a National Father's Day is certainly an appropriate thing to do. For the scripture commands us to honor our fathers, as well, of course, as to honor our mothers. In fact, as you may remember, so important is this commandment and this principle, it actually has a promise attached to it, a promise of blessing, particularly and especially in two areas, areas of provision and areas of protection, which interestingly, at least traditionally, and I would argue biblically, are the particular and peculiar responsibilities of fathers, both earthly and heavenly. So, as we honor our earthly fathers today, so should we also honor our heavenly father today. Because he himself is the source of all fatherhood and the model of what all fathers are called to be. Now, interestingly, today is also Trinity Sunday. It happens every few years. Father's Day falls on Trinity Sunday. So this is a day the church sets aside to celebrate the nature of God revealed to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now that's not to say that we fully understand what this doctrine of the Trinity actually means, nor that we comprehend fully what God's nature is. How many of you know God's greater than any doctrine of man, understanding of man, or comprehension of man? Amen? Amen. That's why he's God and we're not. Amen. Thus, in his essence, God is a mystery. And that's why we sometimes call it the mystery of the Holy Trinity. He's a glorious supernatural being whose very nature inspires reverence and respect, wonder and worship, adoration and awe. Remember what he declared to Moses? Take off your shoes. From the midst of the burning bush, he declared, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And Moses, the Bible says, hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. You see, a holy God inspires a holy fear. My message today is entitled, The Father's Day, The Father's Blessing. Did you get that? The Father's Day, The Father's Blessing. And in this message, we're going to examine three aspects of God's divine nature. Each of these aspects reflect upon and have implications for our own personal life. So believe it or not, I'm going to try to apply the Trinity to us. Wish me luck. 
or better yet, pray hard. Okay. Now, as we do so, examine these three aspects and seek to apply them to our own lives. Understand that we're not attempting to understand what can't be understood. Amen. Amen. But to understand what can be understood. Because God has revealed it to us in his word. Realizing, however, that what we need in our life is not simply greater understanding, but greater faith. Faith which inspires reverence and respect. Faith that inspires wonder and worship. Faith that inspires adoration and awe. Yea, the kind of faith by which we receive the Father's blessing. So I'm hoping that our understanding will actually increase our faith. So aspect number one, God is a trinity. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, hear these following words. Then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. You can see from the very beginning, and that's what the word Genesis means, beginning. God revealed himself as a plurality of being. Did you notice the pronouns? Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. The question is, who's the us and the our? Well, surely it's not the angels because they're not our creator. We have only one creator and that's God. But he calls himself us. Let us make man in our image. He is revealing, again, from the very beginning of creation, that he himself, by his very nature, is a tripartite being. A father, a son, and a Holy Spirit. And when he created us in his image, one of the ways he did so, in my opinion, is to make us a tripartite being like unto him. A body, a soul, and a spirit. We too, in a different measure and a different sense, are also three in one. We're one person, but we have three dimensions, three aspects, three parts of our nature. Are you with me so far? Okay. Now that's why, even after this physical body passes away, we will be resurrected unto eternal life in another body. The Bible calls it a glorified body, or a heavenly body, or a spiritual body. But guess what? It's still a body. That's why the teaching, and I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. The teaching out there in the church that we're really spiritual beings who have a soul and are encased in a body is simply not accurate. We are a tripartite being, body, soul, and spirit, and we're always going to have a body, soul, and spirit, just like Jesus. That's why Jesus was resurrected from the dead in bodily form. How many of you know the tomb was empty? He didn't just leave his body behind when he rose from the dead. Rather, his body was transformed into a resurrected, heavenly, glorified body. You see, having taken upon himself our human nature in the incarnation, he will forever be fully man as he has always been fully God. And so resurrected, he's still fully man. And in that body, he even bears the marks of the cross unto eternity. So, as Jesus became like us, 
in the incarnation, so shall we become like him in the resurrection. 1 John 3, 2 puts it this way. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I say hallelujah, there's hope for all of us. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, morally, in every realm of our life, we are being and shall be transformed into the image and the likeness of the risen, reigning, ruling Lord Jesus Christ. I say that's good news. And precisely, that's what we were created to be from the very beginning. Not fallen, broken, or sinful, but holy, righteous, and whole. We're to represent God on the earth, in His image, in His likeness, and reflect His kingdom in our lives. So much so, in fact, that even though we will always be human in our nature, we actually have the privilege of sharing in some measure in his divine nature. In other words, sharing in the Father's blessing. Second Peter 1 3 puts it this way. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Listen to those three terms again. Divine power, divine promises, divine nature. That's our destiny. That's our calling. That's our inheritance. Listen to them again. Divine power, divine promises, divine nature. So I ask you, knowing our destiny, our calling, and our inheritance, why would we ever even consider anything less or anything else? Amen? In fact, if we consider anything else, it's always something less. And that's the tragedy out there, because there are a lot of people who are settling for less because they settle for else. Tragically, in our generation, people are falling for everything else and settling for everything less. Some are out there settling for false religions. Religions that do not reflect the revelation of God as he truly is. Rather, they're making God in their own image, whereas it was God who made us in his image. Some are settling for immoral lifestyles, satisfying their flesh, but in the process, destroying their souls, and often destroying their flesh also. Some are out there settling for worldly ambitions, which in and of themselves are perfectly fine and of great blessing. But if that's all there is to life, it's not life at all. Because Jesus warned us that we can gain, come on, the whole world and yet forfeit our very soul. Why? Because, as we've seen, man was made for God. And only in God shall man find life abundantly and eternally. Yea, we need the Father's blessing. So aspect number one, God is a trinity. Aspect number two, God is a community. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus says these words. 
I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Then he continues. If you really knew me, the Son, you would know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip answered, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Yeah, right. It's never enough, is it? Nothing ever. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, the Son? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me, the Son, has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? Isn't that interesting? Jesus is revealing to us part of the nature of the God. The Trinity is a community. It's three persons, but one God. Thus, even before the creation came to be, God was in communion with himself. You ever tried to explain the Trinity to anybody? It's very hard. See, that's part of what it means to be created in the image and likeness of God. He intends for us, likewise, to live in relationship with one another, as he is in relationship with himself. Again, Father, Son, and Spirit. In fact, the Trinity isn't simply a community, it's actually a family. And out of that family, which is God, the Father has brought forth a family in his Son. We call it the church. The body of Christ. Here's how St. Paul puts it in Romans 8, 14. All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. In God's family, he is our Father, amen? And we are His sons, not by nature, but by adoption. And as His sons, we are in the position to receive the Father's blessing. That's precisely why it is impossible. Say the word impossible. Do you know what impossible means? Not possible, right? Okay, so it's impossible to be a full Christian and live a full Christian life apart from relationships with other Christians. That was a very good amen. amen. Let me say it again. Not for your benefit, but for people who aren't here. It is impossible to be a full Christian and to fully live the Christian life apart from relationships with other Christians. Amen. It cannot be done. Even though at times we may be sorely tempted for it to be so. There are many Christians who have given up on church. Millions of Christians who have given up on church. As far as they're concerned, it's me and Jesus. And we're a happy couple. Thank you very much. One, one uh, person puts it this way. You can't say you love Jesus and hate his blood. Hey, I got a little amen up for <laughs> You can't say you love Jesus and want nothing to do with his body. Okay, again, 
I understand there may be times when we're tempted for it to be otherwise. Because here's the deal. Are you ready for the deal? Sometimes, believe it or not, people can be a pain. Stop looking at each other. And dealing with people who are pains is painful. Come on, fess it up. It's true. We know that. But here's the deal. Sometimes people think we're the pain, too. Because pain goes both directions. Yeah, they're a pain, but we're a pain. Everybody's a pain, pain. Let's just get over it. Sometimes relationships are painful. Just admit it. It's true. We just have to get over it and let God use it to his glory. You see, whether they're the problem or whether we're the problem, God still demands that we live in community. And he's created us to live in family, particularly and peculiarly the family of God. And here's the deal about that. It is in the family that some of God's richest blessings are to be found that cannot ever be found outside his family. Even, even the Bible says, some of his richest blessings are to be found as the result of those painful relationships. Because God uses conflict, confrontation, and correction to bless us through adversity. Consider, for example, how is it possible to love one another if there's no other to love? I know that wasn't very profound, but it really was. Or consider, how is it possible to forgive others if there's no others to forgive? Or, how is it possible to encourage each other if there's no other to encourage? You see, it presupposes that we live in community. And God's call and purpose is that we do so regardless of our circumstances or our situation. So here's the deal. The church isn't just a good idea, it's God's idea. It's his desire that we reflect his very nature in a family. Not only living together, but striving to live together in unity. Which brings us to the third aspect. God is a trinity, God is a community, and three, God is a unity. John 10, 27. My sheep, Jesus said, listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand, for I and the Father are one. This really is the heart, if you will, of the mystery of the nature of God. Or, I could put it this way, this is the heart of the paradox of God's Trinitarian nature. Even though a trinity is also a unity. Not only by his nature, but also by his relationships within himself. Put simply, the Father and the Son are one relation. Or to put it another way, there's no division, there's no dissension, and there's no disunity in God's character. There's only perfect harmony, complete agreement, and absolute union in the God. And that is precisely what Jesus expects and desires of us as his family on the earth. That we reflect that same unity on the earth as is reflected in heaven. Here's how Jesus put it in John 17, 20. 
My prayer is not for them alone. I also pray for those who will believe in me through their message. Do you know that's us? That all of them, that's us, may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Did you notice the prayer? As he and the Father are in unity, he praying to the Father that we'll be in that same kind of unity. And then listen to this. May they also be in us so that the world might believe that you have sent me. He wants us to be in unity with him, but also in unity with each other. And there's two reasons for that. Not only is unity a source of blessing for the church, it's a sign to the world of the unity of the God. That's why it's so important that we always guard our relationships. Here's the deal again. The enemy loves nothing better than to bring division, dissension, and disunity to the body of Christ. Because when he does, he brings disrepute between the father and the son's relationship with each other that we're supposed to be reflecting. On the earth. That's why Jesus prayed, Father, may they be one as we are one. And so our call is to do whatever it takes to resist the enemy and maintain our unity in Christ. And the reason such perfect unity is always present in the Trinity is very revealing to us in striving for unity the body of Christ. In John 5 and 19, Jesus actually gives the secret or the key to that perfect unity. I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing in Himself. He can only do what He sees His Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. The reason there's always unity in the Trinity is because there's order in the God. In other words, though they're equal in nature, the Son is always submitted to the Father and desires nothing more than to do the Father's will. Put simply, there's never any arguments. There's never any disagreements. There's never any fights. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Because the son always says, Father, what do you want me to do? Father, what do you want me to say? Amen. And whenever there is such divine order, whether in the family of God or in the family of man, there will always be the blessing of unity. For unity is the fruit of divine order. Amen. Well, all which brings us back to Father's Day. Honor your father and your mother, Exodus 20 and verse 12, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Fatherhood, as we've seen, is part of God's order upon the earth for the family of men, as it is part of his order in the heavens, the fatherhood of God. As we so honor our fathers on earth, therefore, so may we also honor our Father who art in heaven. For our Heavenly Father is the source of all fatherhood and the model for what all fathers are called to be. And it works like this. As we so honor both our earthly fathers and our Heavenly Father, so shall we in turn be blessed by our Heavenly Father and live long in the land which He has given us. Yea, by so honoring, we position ourselves to receive the Father's blessing. Amen. And may it be increasingly so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us then stand and declare our common faith.